Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Oh, g'day, how are you going? It's Phil Tarrant here. I'm the uh, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Everyone's been asking about it. They've been waiting for it, wondering what's going on. When are we going to release it? The 2025 Smart Property Investment SPI Fast 50 Report. Well, I'm happy to report. Here we are, and this is it. Launching it via the Property Investment Podcast Network. You'll be able to download this as soon as you tune into this particular podcast on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. It's the hottest ticket in town, this report. Here we are again for the second year running. We have this report, and from what I understand, we get it pretty right. And I reckon this year, hopefully, we'll do the same thing. So this is where to put your money today for the best capital growth in 2025, it's a fast 50, the, the the 50 best suburbs to invest in for 2025 based on where you're going to get the biggest uplift in capital growth. That's what we're all about. Joining me back in the studio, again, partnering us on this report, Paul Glossop, who is the CEO of Pure Property Investment. He's back. He's in demand. And maybe we'll get it right. What do you reckon, Paul? <laughs> Matt, I think maybe we've got it right. And uh, we talked about this off air that uh, we, we, we reviewed and did a bit of a an overlay with the CoreLogic fastest uh, growing suburbs for 2023 last mm. year and essentially overlaid that with the report that we released early last year. And there's some pretty good news to report for those who followed that guide. It, there is. And, and the data that we use, so the, the – and we'll, we'll go through today what, how, how we come about, you know, coming up with the Fast 50 uh, suburbs. But the data we use, the data partner we have, the data we rely on is from Core Logic. So uh, thank you very much to our friends over there who provide us this data. And all this data is available on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au on the data feature. It's free. Uh, a lot of people use it. drives a lot of traffic on Smart Property Investment, people tinkering with the data. Uh, what we do is that we use that data plus a whole bunch of other ways that we assess and measure things to come up with the Fast 50. But let's start off with the credibility builder, Paul. Cool. So we did this last year. We, we launched did. it sort of uh, a little bit later in the year. So we thought we'd yep. bring it forward. Where to put your money today for the best capital growth in 2024? Here we are, 2024. So this report, where to put your money today for the best capital growth in 2025. So what did we say last year to give some eff- efficacy to this report and whether or not people should rely on it? Did we get it right? Or are we getting it right? Because we're only at the start of 2024. Well, that's kind of it, right? And, and I think to, to premise... Or everything that we're talking about in these reports, and you noticed anyone who downloaded last year's report noted that the the title was where to put your money for the best capital growth in 2024. So we're not talking about a two month, six month, eight month time frame. We're talking about typically an 18 month, depending on when you download it time frame. And I guess the the really amazing thing when we sort of overlaid all that data, and I sort of mentioned it very early when we did the intro, was that. Last year, uh, everyone would have noted, anyone who read the report from last year, that was a, a relatively heavy weighting towards both uh, the Brisbane but also the Perth markets. And I'm uh, very much a, a, was a big, big advocate for certain areas across the Perth metro and a couple of areas sort of north and south of the Perth metro last year and the year before and the year before that for that matter. Um, but when we overlay that with the core logic, uh, strongest 12-month growth in values, absolute delta of which out of the 10,000 plus suburbs across Australia grew and the top 10 suburbs, bar none, from the most expensive north of 9 million to the cheapest south of $200,000, out of that top 10, the Fast 50 report, and I'm glad to note that Pure Property Investment selected six of the top 10 fastest growing suburbs out of 10,000 suburbs in Australia. And they were all in that report from last year. So if I'm looking at that, each one of those markets was well north of 25% capital growth for the 12 months, and there's uh, some very strong yields to boot in a lot of those markets as well. So the point is, is that out of 10,000 suburbs in Australia, last year, smart property investment in conjunction with uh, pure property investment, plus a whole bunch of other mm-hmm. very capable people in and around um, uh, the property space. So we were able to synthesise 10,000 in a 50 and out of that 50 we come up with, six of them were the fastest growing suburbs out of 10,000. Out of 10,000. And I imagine the other 46 probably featured pretty well inside they, of that. They that, all that featured list. very yeah. well. And, and it, north of 10% capital growth, pretty okay. much every single suburb in that year. But our, our best six were in the top 10 
of the entire year, okay. of the entire, every single suburb, not postcode, but suburb mm. in Australia. Okay. And and by postcode and or suburb, let's talk about a suburb that I know well, mm. 2147. Sevo. Which is Seven Hills. <laughs> so Seven Hills includes Layla Park and mm. includes Kings Langley. Uh, so all very unique suburbs in their own right. Correct. And Seven, Seven Hills itself, Seven Hills North, uh, Seven Hills South, yep. uh, all over the joint. So this is down at the suburb end, not is, just the postcode. Exactly. Because I know pretty much the whole of the Central Coast has a 2259 mm. postcode, right? Correct. It's pretty much all of the Central Coast. Yeah. So this is down to suburb level. Suburb level. Okay. This isn't This isn't the, the SA3 level. This is tight. This is absolute suburb level. And yeah. um, that's the beauty about really where this report has a lot of credence and I think it'll have a lot of clout this year because people are going to read it and they're going to take notice because I'll give one example. Armadale is a market that at the start of last year, I personally bought some investments in that market. I put my money where my mouth is and I can mm. attest to the fact that Assets that I bought circa three hundred, three hundred and forty thousand dollars, a number of them um, would be well and truly very close to five hundred thousand dollars, if not a bit more now in twelve months' time, and they're yielding circa five fifty to six fifty a week in rent. Now, that is an exponential position if you had the ability to leverage. And also, I guess the other thing I highlight there is that we're talking about markets and property types which are achievable for many. Yes. Not most, but many. Many. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so, so what you're saying then is out of 10,000, we chose 50, and all those 50, they all performed well, but six of them were in the top 10 of Australia, and you invested in three of those suburbs. I did, personally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I can probably- So happy days. Happy days. And Crap I know dinners, out of 300, all over the 400 <laughs> odd, odd clients of ours from last year, a good, good portion of those would have yeah. also achieved some similar similar outcomes. Okay. So I don't want to pat ourselves on the back too much. No. Did, did we that get was, a, that was a, then, did, this did, is now. Did we get it wrong at all? <laughs> did, like, is there anything, any clangers uh, in, in last year's report um, where we're just, I, where, where we're out of, out of the- um, if I look at last year's report, and I'll, I'll probably more look at, at, at general cities as opposed to suburbs, mm. but noting if I go to a couple of markets, which personally I know we didn't want to touch, um, but I know were, were sort of recommended by a couple of people on the panel, but there wasn't many, if I'm honest. Um, there was one in Tasmania and two in Victoria. Okay. Out of the 50, those three that were in two separate states would have been underperforming okay. out of 50 if yep. I'm honest. Yep. Um, not that we would have recommended Tasmania nor Victoria last year. Um, there was only four out of the 50 in New South Wales last year. There was 10 out of the 50 in South Australia, 15 in Western Australia, 18 in Queensland. And when, when we get to the point of, of everyone downloading the report for this year, you'll notice that that certainly has changed a little bit. Um, the weighting is still somewhat similar. You'll notice that some of the, the more known uh, Eastern Seaboard markets are Sydney and Melbourne. Yep. Um, they're certainly not featuring the same way they probably have in previous years or even decades. But word to the wise, and this is probably where I just want everyone to just take a quick pause, is to say we're talking about 12-month, 24-month growth positions here. We're not talking about a five, seven, 10-year position. And mm. I, I want to stress that because just because, you know, for instance, those properties that I talked about that I invested in last year uh, from the Fast 50 report did really well. The intention is that I don't want to see a portfolio that is only selecting markets because of what a 12-month or 24-month outcome would look like. And we're certainly not recommending that in this report, everyone should be buying markets that are in this report either, because some people might already have exposure here. Some people might be thinking, okay, I want something in that three, four, five counter-cyclical markets. And mm. I can guarantee there is a large number of markets, which we are actually buying in, which won't feature in this year's report. But the intention is that we might already have a strategy to say that person might already have something in that market. So let's look at two, three, four, five years down the track here as well. Yeah. So again, it's it's the uniqneness of every single investor Absolutely. based on where they are and what they're doing. Yep. Um, and and having looked through um, this year's report, and I've got to work out whether or not I'm going to be that guy who teases everyone and just go, if you want to find out where it is, you've got to download the report, smartpropertyinvestment.com. I'm probably not going to give too much away. If you want to find out where these suburbs are, you've got to go and find out. But the point of this podcast is the effic efficacy of the report, whether or not it can be relied upon. Yep. It's what, would you what would you score us? Give me a score. I'd, I'd Give score me a percentage. It, I'd score it a good 8.9 to 9.2 out of 10. Okay. So God. somewhere in that 90% range, I think, is – and that's probably being a little bit conservative because I did mention there was probably mm. three suburbs out of 50, which I know I personally wouldn't have bought. 2024 is only two months old, mate. It is. It is true. No, that is very and, and, true. And I'm hearing um, 
I mean, uh, good things. Pocket, pockets, <laughs> pockets of Melbourne are, are really starting to shift in the gear. Uh, so. See, secret squirrel yeah, there. And, and, and for anyone who's thinking about downloading the report and looking at those markets in Melbourne, you probably won't see too much. You might see a little bit. Yeah. But again, don't get too uh, caught up in what's happening here and now. It's, yeah. You might be thinking it's next year's report or the year after. But a bit of counter-cyclical buying. For those who are happy to say, look, I've got a bit of exposure in those markets that are in the report, there are other markets that will probably be two or three years off. And in addition... I guess the other thing that I probably didn't highlight there at the start was that out of those six out of the 10 that we selected, if I look at the actual yield um, and, and look at the highest gross rental yield markets for last year's core logic report for 2023, again, again across 10,000 suburbs, if I'm looking at major city markets, I'm looking at that report as we speak, one, two, three, four of those markets in the top 10 were also four of the fastest growing capital growth markets. So not only were they selected from six of the best capital growth markets out of the 10,000, four of those suburbs were also in the top 10 major metro markets for highest gross rental yield. And mm. all of them are north of six and a half, six point eight percent 6.8%, some in the vicinity of 7, 8, 9%. Okay. As well. All right. So, so this this podcast is part of a uh, six part special series over six days. So uh, you're tuning into this. There's five more to come, and we're going to sort of pull this report apart, unpack it, um, look at all the, the the intricacies of it. Uh, importantly, how you actually use the report. That'll be a, a podcast that we uh, we look at um, and, and and give some sense to what smart investors are doing uh, by having this information, this intelligence. Uh, information intelligence only is good on how you act on it or upon it. So we'll, we'll break uh, that down. Uh, we'll look at the intersection between capital growth. This is a capital growth uh, orientated report, but um, uh, the cash consequences of that as well and how you can best navigate and steer your decision making uh, around that dichotomy of um, uh, balancing capital growth with cash flow and, and how that will work. Uh, we'll break it down in the metro um, and, and regional um, setting to see, you know, what, what, what's the what's the makeup of the fastest growing suburbs in Australia? Are they metro based or are they a regional based? And and very much we spoke about this last year. Uh, this is the fast fifty, you know, by memory with this particular report. And I could probably tell you exactly how many it was, but there was nearing a couple of hundred recommendations uh, from our panel, um, of which we had to uh, weed down into fifty. So we'll look at some of those areas that didn't make the list this year. However, that doesn't mean they're not good places to invest in. And that may lend itself, Paul, to what you're saying about counter-cyclical investing or investing mm. for the future or suburbs to watch. Um, uh, so we'll break that down as well. And then we'll look at it really tactically. Okay. What do you do now that you've got all this information, you have all these insights? Um, you know, you took action. Mm -hmm. You bought three properties uh, on, on the basis of this report. I've got to work out whether or not I'll do the same. I might throw one into my super fund. Um, why not? Yep. Uh, get get some skin in the game. Maybe I might take your recommendation on on which one uh, you said you were to do put that it last into. Year, Phil. You're a statistic, unfortunately. I know I was, but I had to deploy my dough somewhere else at that <laughs> point in time. <laughs> and this is and but it comes out of tactics, right? You know, you can't do everything all the time. Yeah. Well, I'm you know. sure your kids will enjoy the Taylor Swift tickets that you bought instead. Anyway. I, I know, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Better investment, Paul. Well, you, it depends who you ask. I'm sure your daughters would be agreeing to Did you see Tay Tay when I she was in town? I have not seen Tay Tay. She's, no. uh, I think she's Tay tay in Sydney at the moment. No, no, yeah, it's uh, it's all happening. Um, Pink, Pink, Pink was here. Pink was here. Blink, Blink, Blink one eight two. It's all, I, all I, the saw, big I saw, names I saw, I saw Blink one eight two on the interweb with someone singing. I went, they really didn't feel like they were into it. It was just like singing, singing, singing for singing Most for a check for ten thousand plus. Yeah. They're like it is. It's good money for them. It's yeah. not the Horden Pavilion days of, of <laughs> yesteryear. That's really good. But you know, this is we're just launching this special series. The report is out. You can go and download it now. Be the first. Not the last. Not the last, the first, because it means you're getting these insights earlier. Uh, uh, you know, speed to information often is an enabler for decision-making as well. So uh, make sure you tell your friends that the report is out there. It's free to download, isn't it? Yes. It is 100% yes. yes. free to download. And and I think words to the wise, guys, is that you know, last year there was tens of thousands of these reports downloaded. And, and I don't want to be seen as someone who's a bit of a naysayer or uh, I guess someone who thinks that this is going to – shift markets artificially, but I can I can probably attest to some of these markets that I know we were very much buying bespoke in quite on the on the down low for a while. Once these reports come out, 
um, and the numbers are a little bit more mass understood, uh, what invariably happens is that these markets get hotter and mm. that happens relatively quickly. So if you digest the report and you think you want to take action, I would suggest doing so sooner rather than later. And a big portion of that, making sure that your funding is ready as well, is is probably a word to the wise. I see too many people think buy first, figure out finance second. I think that's probably a big part too here is that in, in conjunction with this report and thinking about taking action, get your finances sorted as soon as possible also. That's a, a good tip. Um, so the idea of this launch podcast gives some sense to how, how we've done it. So I think we've proven, we've given some sense of the, the bona fides of the report. Mm. So I, yeah, you reckon somewhere 80 plus 90% score rate on last year. Yep. That's not bad going. Whether or not we can do it again, who knows? I cannot make any guarantees at all. <laughs> there is zero. We may get it completely wrong. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, the way in which we put this report together uh, helps ameliorate some of those issues because this is just not Phil and Paul sitting there going, oh, let's, let's, uh, where, where do we reckon we should be investing? What we've done is curate a panel of 11 property experts. And I also sit on this panel, I don't call myself a property expert, but someone to help sort of steer and navigate um, and, and, and sometimes be the tiebreaker if they do come up to actually provide my uh, view and lens in a bit. We've got some heavy hitters inside of real estate uh, on this report, Paul, um, you know, noting that that you are our partner putting this together. You sit on that panel uh, as the CEO of uh, Pure Property Investment. Some other very, very big names in property uh, in this report. Most people would know of Margaret Lomaz, director at My Property Match. And most people would know John McGrath, uh, CEO and executive director of McGrath Estate Agents. Um, a lot of people would know Simon Presley, head of research at Propertyology. He's always flying the flag for regional Australia, which is, is always good yeah. to get that that different blend. And um, he's and he's very secret squirrel too. So for anyone who is trying to get info out of him, he, I mean, not that this is going to name who selected what suburbs, but he's no. put his name to a few. And that's a good point. It's it's unless unless they're decided to give a quote or something yeah. around a particular suburb. We've we've kept a lot of it sort of... Un, un, Intentionally. It's yeah, how you get yeah. Simon in on this. Saying, yeah, well, yeah, we won't yeah. say... That's all right. It's, it's, it's okay, Simon. So okay. so, you know, he, he's, he's, good he, he's, he's got... And, and, and this is the point, right? Um, everyone does it differently. Correct. You know, ev- everyone has their own methodology for identifying suburb. Look, most people invest in real estate because they want it to go up in value, right? Yep. So let's just... Yep. that That's at centre of this. Yeah. How people work out what suburbs are going to go up in the value. Everyone's got their own way of doing it. And Simon's got a particular way of doing it. You've got a particular way of doing it, Paul. Margaret has a particular way of doing it. And there's a lot of commonality, to be fair, because they're all very yep. um, um, uh, proven and capable people. John McGrath, for yep. example, he's been at this for, for decades, right? Yep. Um, and yeah. success leaves clues. I mean, for these people who have been in this game for a long time, you notice that there's actually a fair bit of overlay. I look through this list and without me speaking to Margaret or to John or to Simon or to Angus Rain of Rain and Horn, and without me directly speaking to them saying, here's what we're putting into this report and colluding prior to this, literally everyone's asked for their opinion. It's and separate. It's separate. And then you look through this report and you see the overlay. And it's amazing that you get with 11 people, 10,000 suburbs, that you mm. get overlay on half of the 150-odd suburbs that have been nominated. And, and, and that is the strength of this report and the, and the methodology we put into it. Simon Liu, founder of House Finder, Arjun Paliwell. Uh, founder and head of research, investigate. I know Arjun well. He's a good operator and he's got his particular yep. brand of doing stuff, a particular way of doing stuff. Uh, Angus Rain, executive chairman of Rain and Horn, very large group. So two very large real estate groups there in, in Rain and Horn and, and McGrath. Uh, Lena Lindley, she's one of your colleagues uh, over at um, Pure Product Investors. She's one of your, she's senior buyers agent with you Correct. guys, right? Yep. Um, and then we get to... And I always struggle with her name, and I and and, and maybe you can help me out with this. <laughs> no, uh, d- uh, Dr. Diaswati Marismo, you know, Mar- chief economist, Mar- PRD Mar- Mar- Marismo. <laughs> and I'm sorry, um, Diswati, uh, uh, Dis- Diswati, that I, I'm sometimes not good with names, but really capable uh, economist over Absolutely. at PRD Real Estate, another big group. And uh, Charlotte uh, Pasco, CEO of Stockdale and Lego. So these are it's a good blend of it's a very good buyers, blend. agents, data people. And, and real estate. Yep. Uh, and my job is to try and sort of herd the cats that is yep. this group of people. But uh, this so, so the way it works, we, we said to all these 11 highly capable people, give us the 20, it was, give us the 20 suburbs you think are going to offer the best capital growth in 2025. We didn't say based on Anything. whatever parameters, like you tell us. Yep. It's really it. You tell no us. No budget constraints, no, no yield constraints. No. Just give us growth that you think is going to achieve. 
growth, and that that was it. So give us the growth, and and someone might do it by gazing into a crystal ball, and that's how they come up with a twenty. Some people may sort of look at the crystals or get the tarot cards out, <laughs> but most and I'd like to think all the of the Ouija people board. in uh, the Ouija board. That's what we should do. Is like a <laughs> the property, property Ouija, Ouija board. board. <laughs> just get like ten thousand underneath. We've just got magnets on the table, <laughs> yeah. just moving things or around, a big wheel of fortune, ten thousand yeah, suburbs. Yeah, chocolate spin wheel. It. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but we asked all of them to provide their um, identify their twenty suburbs for property investment over the 12 months. Um, uh, so the best suburbs to invest in are the 20, 25. And what we did, we got all of them together, our team. Uh, we we, we uh, 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 used the very capable um, skills of Agile Marketing Intelligence, which is a big research company. We goes, here's all the here's all the information. We need you to run it for us. And what they did, they, they looked at where all the commonality was. So... Did everyone vote for the same suburb, yep. for example? That obviously scores well. If only one person voted for one suburb, it's going to score less. So what we looked at was for that aggregate commonality of perception towards the potential for capital growth, irrespective of how they come up with it. Yep. So if everyone chose the same suburb, it's going to be doing well and it's going to score higher as a result of it. But what we did then, and this is up to, so this data, this is the most recent data, we had, which is the 12 months to December 2023. So this is the most current data we had at the start of February. Yeah. So it's pretty much comes to us as the January data for the close of December. So it's the most recent data we had and you're probably going to get. And this is from our good friends over at RP Data. So thank you again for providing all this information. So what we did then was overlay... This information, these suburbs, call it a, a short list of suburbs, which are hierarchical because we know the more that one person, the more that some people voted for certain suburbs means it's going to uh, get a higher weighting to it. But then we did an overlay of some key factors and it was um, median quarterly growth, uh, which is how much has it changed over the last quarter. We weighted that. 12-month growth, which was what has been the change from this time to what it was 12 uh, months ago. Mm -hmm. And then we also overlaid by memory was average annual growth. So how does it track over time? Uh, and then also we had a, a yield component of it all. So how does it yield from a, um, a rental point of view? So, yep. and we weighted them slightly different. Um, yep. giving yield greater... was not high from memory. I think it's circa 5%. So yeah, 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 it cash is. Cash flow is not exactly the, the prerogative it's not, here. It's not. But what you want to be doing is that you can't invest on capital growth alone. No. The idea is that you want to try and have as strong a cash flow as possible as you hold these properties to support the growth over time. That The higher weighting is towards um, a median quarterly growth. So how much has it changed over the last quarter and how is that sort of moving ahead con considering what it's done in the last 12 months yep. and what is its average annual growth? So that's how we've done it all together. So it's a really unique way of balancing it all. So you've got this more qualitative approach, which is, hey, tell us what you think. And then we do overlay the data. Yeah. And, and by memory, it's about 65 35% or, or 70, 30% and yep. now we did it. I think it's 20, 10, 10, 5 and then the rest is um, in, the uh, in, in, uh, in in the scoring of the suburbs. Oh, so that's how we come up with waiting, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's and, how the waiting works. And I've just dragged out, as we've, you've been going there, Phil, I've just dragged out one of the suburbs that I'm looking at right now in this report and, and I've got CoreLogic left on my phone in front of me here and you can probably see that on the phone there. Mm. Um, you can break down monthly growth now, um, and, and this is a new feature via RP Data, which is fantastic when you want to see not just know, quarterly. They do that. They do monthly yeah, now. So monthly, and and I'll walk through. So this is a really interesting one. So one of the suburbs that's in there, um, this goes through from when we launched last year, but as of May last year, one of the suburbs here, and I'll go through one of the suburbs as far as monthly goes: 05 percent, one point two percent, one point one percent, two point three percent, one point one percent, one point four percent, two point nine percent. That's from May to January. And oh, sorry, that's from May to November. I lie. That's okay. that's where that's looking at right now. And I can guarantee you, when you look at December, January, February, there's a couple other suburbs that I know we've got up to up to January data on monthly. A lot of those markets monthly is actually increasing on the growth as well. You notice in what I just rattled off there, yeah. it's actually getting slightly stronger per month. That's one suburb out of this top 50. And you could do the math on that there. It starts to become a very significant oh, compounded well, growth well, position. Well, those people that know how to use compounding growth calculators, that's just not like 1% on a base. That's 1% yes, on last year's or last last month's number, and then up yeah, again and, and again. And that's the beauty of, of, of compounding the capital growth, of right? The world. It is. It is. So, um, so there we have it, all set up, ready to go. We haven't told anyone anything other than how we've done it and what we did last year was pretty good. So it's maybe good. you should go and check it out. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile. We've got to give our listeners something. 
yeah. as part of this. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you which states um, fared and how they fared uh, this year. Uh, just a little teaser. Uh, and you'll go download a report and you'll be able to find out. Western Australia, Paul, more than half, more than half of these suburbs, uh, 26 to be exact, uh, it's its time in the sun. It is. Uh, and, and whether or not it'll be like this next year and the year after, who knows? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, Western Australia was in the doldrums for some time. This isn't the spe- this isn't historical. And again, mm. I think this is key is that we're not talking about what grew best last year because, to be honest, that market did do the best last year. And we just noted that six out of the ten best-growing suburbs are in our report, hint, hint. Yep. So many of those were in Western Australia as well. Yeah, but um, what... what What's happened in the past to get a suburb to where it is won't necessarily no. or guarantee you what's going to happen to the future. And, and this future, goes back to your what methodology. Is that? Future, what is it? Future returns cannot be guaranteed. <laughs> the, yeah, By the way, let's do a disclosure. Guarantee. I'm going to do a disclosure, everyone. So I've got to do it. We've done our best at this. We're just providing some information based on how we've gone about approaching this. Yep. Uh, the methodology we've applied, the people we've brought in, we've tried our absolute best. And this is just information, if, I, I, you know, do not rely on this. No. Um, it's not investment Use it advice. as a guide. It's not an investment guide. Go and speak to someone that knows what they're doing, buyer's agent like yourself, yep. or make sure you speak to your accountant, any other trained fin- – I'm not a trained financial professional. I'm not a trained anything maybe other than uh, – <laughs> what am I trained at? <laughs> I could come up with so many things. I just can't say any of them. They're not going to I'm be appropriate. Actually, I'm just actually trying to think what I'm actually trained or got a certificate. I've got certificates. I can drive an excavator. CPR. <laughs> I got a ticket to drive an excavator. I CPR. Mark, probably uh, no, I, I, I um, uh, I, I, forklift. No, I can't drive. I'm not allowed to drive. I was a um, yeah. a ticketed snowboard instructor, so ticketed. I was trained. Right. Uh, I was a trained lifeguard. Right. Uh, I was a trained uh, uh, first aid. Um, I'm hearing the word Te- was teacher. a lot here. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 these are all gone. Yeah. It's about, you know, I taught people that sort of stuff. Um, mm. Yeah, that's about the extent These days, no, not nothing. so much. I'm trained. Not, not so uh, much. Anyway, so go to a proper, proper. Uh, licensed financial professional that yeah. has all the tickets uh, when it comes to making investment decisions. Hopefully this information can help you shape your decision making. And I'm sorry, but, you know, this is – we've done our best, but – you can't rely on it. So Absolutely. Anyway. And, and I think probably the last thing I'd add to that, Phil, is uh, we, we went through this very similar last year and, and we talked and, and we talked just re- referring back to places like WA and you, you explained the fact that... 26, by the way, in WA. 26, there yeah. you go, 26 out of 50. And if we look through the previous 10 years in places like WA, the average annual... 10-year growth, um, and I know I'm looking at a suburb from last year. I won't talk about which What's one it was. What's it start with? Starts with what's the suburb start with? Yeah. An A what's ends, it in, ends in Mardale. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's but last you, you, year. You can actually say this. So it was in last year's. It was board. in last year's. Board. Yeah, Armadale yeah. was a market yeah. last year. Last te- previous ten years, average annual growth was one point six percent. Yeah. So I guess the point I'm 1. trying to make. One point six percent average annual and average annual growth, which was, that was a market that ended up doing twenty percent last year. Yeah. Now I guess the big point that I'm trying to make here is not just hey be nervous about markets that have boomed the previous year, but also you've got to question markets which have had 7, 8, 9% average annual growth for a previous 10 years. Previous performance is not a predictor of future performance. <laughs> and that is what we're trying to get at here is yeah. that we're not buying for, again, we're not buying for a one-year outcome, but we are also looking at other factors. And it's not just, hey, if the market's done really well over 10 years, it should do well over the next 10 years. And also conversely, if a market's done really poor, doesn't mean it's poised to boom. There's got to be a range of factors that really push these markets yeah, into Yeah, and we can pull that apart uh, in this special podcast series, which will be over the next uh, six days, including today. Um, but but this is the point. So 1.6% average annual growth for 10 years. It's yep. growing at nearly at 2% yep. and monthly and at the moment, right? Correct. So you sit there and just go, something's not right. Mm. Some, something's not right. You go, no, nah, there's something wrong here. Well, hot tip, it didn't grow for 10 years. Yeah. And most people that bought property... 10 years prior thinking that these are going to be boom suburbs because they were doing pretty well, sat on their deposit money sitting inside of that with the mortgage a massive, for a huge yeah. opportunity And prior lost. 10 years to those, if you rewind between 2013 and 2000 for mm. markets such as Armadale, that market tripled yeah. in that time. So then you start to draw a longer time horizon than 10 years. You start to look at 25 years. You're like, okay, I start to see the trends mm. where a market can't go 3x 
and then go 3x again in the following 15 years. And hence why then you say, well, why did it pause? Why did it go sideways? Why did it go backwards for a period of three, four or five years? Yeah. Well, there's got to be a lot of different pressures, economic pressures, supply pressures, essentially jobs creation pressures. And these are the things that we always have to consider. And that's what goes into this report. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later in this series. This is the overlay of economic mm. dynamics. Um, uh, and Western Australia in particular is, is it's a mining state. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of its uh, feasts and famines is directly correlates to what they're digging out of the ground and shipping off overseas, right? You know, yes, they're they're diversifying with other industries. You know, we only saw um, last week uh, the uh, the surface fleet review Correct. coming out of defence, and they, they, they said they're going to start building a lot of ships out they in Anderson. Yep. Okay, that's cool. Yep. You know, so that's a more of a diversified economic. Yep base and footprint for, for Western Australia. But, you know, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So 25 in Western Australia. But to your point, Paul, this is about timing the market as well as time in the market. It's a cliche sort of term everyone uses, but you could have chosen Armadale 10 years ago and nothing happened for 10 years. Yep. You could have chosen it last year and got 20% uplift, yep. right? We could have chosen it 25 years ago and you got Forex. one market cycle, <laughs> then flat, and then this current market cycle, there you go. So this is how long you're in the market. So it's all about got to get in at the right time, and then you've got to know what your long-term strategy is on holding that property. So we'll get into that. 26 in Western Australia, 9 in Queensland. So that's, you know, it's, it's a big disparity. 8 in South Australia, which is reasonably consistent with last year. 4 in New South Wales, 3 in Victoria. Zero in the Australian Capital Territory, zero in the Northern Territory, and zero in Tasmania. What we don't really take into uh, um, at a formal level um, into consideration through this report, but no doubt the experts have done it on their assessments, is the application we've spoken about in the past, the what the governments are doing in each of these states and how that sort of is fueling property investment, what the government's doing in these states to sort of fuel property development, what are they doing in terms of doing shaping your ability to charge rental increases and all that. It's a big economic and political sort of underlay mm. as part of this world. And perhaps we can touch on that a little bit later. But, Paul, what do people do now? They go and download the report. Download the report first and foremost. So smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. It'll be front and centre. You can download it. It'll probably take all of 10 to 30 seconds to get it into your hot little hands. And then it's, it's about reading it, digesting it. And then from there, look, to be honest with you, if you stop there, unfortunately, you might be listening to this podcast in 12 months' time and thinking, wow, there's a handful of suburbs which... Which well mean, most out. people will be. That's most what, people will most, be. Not you, some. Most will most, probably. Most don't will be. be a statistic. Yeah, I don't want to yeah. be too kind there, I guess. Yeah. And, and and for me, that that's the key here is that, look, we can talk about this till we're blue in the face. I was talking about off air with one of your colleagues, Phil, who was talking about doing something last year with me and um, they'll come to me just now and they're part of this report and part of putting it together. And they're like, I'm, I'm ready to do something. And... Just don't be a statistic. I think for me, that's the key is that once you've had a look, once you're confident that, yes, I can find something in there that will fit my budget, they can reach out to us at purepropertyinvestment.com, lock in a time to actually discuss how do we implement what we have available, which markets, which property types can we deploy that cash into that's going to get us the outcome that we're really after here. And yeah. that's our job is 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 the the what. Um, the why probably and, and the, the outcome that we expect is in this report for a 12 or 24 month period of time. And there's also something for a range of different budgets and yields in there. So if you're a higher net worth individual, you're not necessarily concerned about cash flow. There are higher price markets, which we expect to do really well, potentially better quality assets. If you're entry level, there are still markets in there, sub $500,000 that are going to give you north of a 6% yield and essentially probably only needing 60, 70 grand to get started in those markets as well. So there is a range of different op options, property types and markets that I think can really be, really be visited by most. Well, let's pick that up uh, tomorrow when we get together and we talk about how you start using this report because uh, execution is critical uh, and we're all aware of the old sort of mantra of um, imperfect action always trumps perfect inaction. And most of those people who tuned in and downloaded last year's report are probably looking for perfection before they do anything. So how you use this re report is to give you confidence and support decision making. But we'll get into that tomorrow. That's Paul Glossop from Pure Property Investments. I'm Phil Tarrant from Momentum Media, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Welcome to this special series as we unveil the Fast 50. Let's give them one suburb before we leave. One suburb. One suburb. One suburb. One I suburb. <laughs> I'll give them one. I'll give them one. Okay. Um, if you've got a touch over half a mil to spend, Baldivis. Okay. Yep. Cool. Perth. There you go.
It's That's all why. in there. Smartprotinvestment.com.au. Go and download it. We'll see you again tomorrow. Go and tune into it. Go and download it first so you can actually be a lot more connected with what we're talking about. Uh, look forward to seeing or listening or chatting to you then. Until then, goodbye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.